Well, good morning. Welcome to Good Samaritan Church in Pinellas Park, Florida. As we always say here at Good Sam, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are welcome here if you are gay or straight or a little bit of both. You are welcome here if you are a peacemaker or if you're one of the frozen chosen or a little bit of both. You are welcome here if you show grace to others always or if sometimes you struggle with it or a little bit of both. You are welcome here and we are glad you are with us. We extend a special welcome to those who will join us later in the week on YouTube, watching our recording. We're glad for however you can join us in worship. And now let us uh, start with our song of welcome. Today is World Peace Day, so you will notice that some of the music is a little different than our usual. Our song of welcome is called A Dedication As For Me And My House. You'll notice it's very repetitive. So friends, I invite you now to unmute yourself and we will say all together in just a moment, the peace of Christ be with you. <coughs> Are you ready? ready? The peace of Christ, peace of Christ be with, with you. And also with you. Friends, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. This morning, we light this candle to remember that Jesus, the light of the world, is the host of our time together, even here virtually. Now I'd like to invite Jeremy to call us to worship. On this Peace Sunday, we are invited to come together to worship, to praise, and to reflect on the Holy Word. May we come into this space with open hearts, setting down our burdens and frustrations, even for just an hour, so that we can embrace the message of peace, mercy, and compassion. Come and accept the call to be in the presence of God with one another this morning. I invite you to join us for uh, our next song. Again, this is a little bit different than we're used to. Um, sing whenever you feel that you've got it down. It will be repetitive. We're grateful for the music shared with us today for UCC Congregations. Uh, the singer of that last song is married to a good friend of mine from seminary. I'm glad to have her music today. Let us listen now to our scripture passage. It comes from the book of Jonah from chapters three and four. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them and God did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to God and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and what ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh God, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And God said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a tent for himself there. He sat under its shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. God appointed a bush and made it come up and cover Jonah and give shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and he asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in the night and perished in the night. 
And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray. Oh, still speaking, God, we come to you this morning longing to hear a fresh word spoken into our lives, into our world. And so we pray this morning that my mouth and all of our mouths and all of our uh, meditations would be pleasing to you. And where we depart from your spirit, O oh God, may that quickly fall away. Amen. Well, the saying goes, karma is a... I don't think I need to finish that one. But the truth is there are a lot more of us who want to believe in karma than in grace. Now, maybe not for ourselves. For ourselves, we want the grace. Heaps and heaps of grace. But for those around us, especially for those who harm us or who move the world in a direction we don't want it to go, we want them to get their just desserts, experience the full weight of justice, which is not, by the way, the same as God's justice, but more on that later. We want them to get what's coming to them. Now, don't tell me you haven't thought it. Maskers turn to me and they whisper sheepishly, as if they know it's wrong even to think it. I hope all these anti-maskers get COVID. Meanwhile, anti-maskers are on social media expressing their hopes that their neighbor's overreaction to COVID backfires and they lose their job or go bankrupt, etc. There is a reason that both sides of the aisle are screaming at one another, lock her up, lock him up. Wanting retribution, wanting someone to pay for what we perceive to be their crimes, it comes pretty naturally to most of us. We don't want us, we don't just want us to win, we want them to lose. We don't just want injustices righted, we want them punished. This last week we lost a justice giant. We lost someone who fought valiantly for those on the margins and those who have been on the bottom of some of the world's power dynamics. Whether you are a woman or an LGBT person, or a differently abled person, or a person of color, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a big part of the reason that you have found some doors of opportunity cracked open, or at least some of the obstacles removed. Of course, with the news of her death, a wave of grief has swept through our nation. But many people I know, and maybe you too, have described first, before the grief, feeling fear, terror, as the shocking realization set in that so much of her work writing injustices, unbinding the legal chains, shackling people, that so much of it might be undone. And what will that mean for humanity, for our hopes of peace and beloved community? And that fear for many quickly segued this weekend into anger, even into rage. Maybe you felt it too. Perhaps it had started earlier in the week when news broke about the forced sterilizations and international crime against humanity that was happening at our immigrant, immigrant detention centers. I heard so many people around me this weekend going back to 2016 and raging against decisions our fellow citizens made that, that some believe created this environment where basic human rights could be threatened. As one person put it, I will never forgive them for the terrifying feeling I felt at the death of RGB when I should have been able to lean into grief and begin to celebrate a life well lived. 
The hunger for retribution is gnawing at the souls of many in our country this weekend. And maybe it's gnawing at yours too. And dang, it sure feels righteous. Which is why one of the most scandalous teachings in the Bible is grace. It's what makes people flock to our faith tradition because we all hunger for grace, need it personally. But it's also what makes the life of faith so difficult to enter. Because in the Judeo-Christian tradition, grace isn't just for us, it's also for our enemies. Accepting that our enemies too will receive grace, that's a hard pill to swallow. Accepting that those who have harmed us will have their slate wiped clean, it's nearly an impossible task. We would really like for ourselves, the gentle Jesus, you know the picture I'm talking about, the one with the sheep, the lost sheep slung over Jesus' shoulders. We'd like that Jesus for ourselves. But man, give us the judgmental hellfire and brimstone Jesus for our enemies, please. It's why I think so many Christians cling so tightly to the belief that grace is only for people of their own religion, that it's exclusively theirs. Because the idea that everyone would receive grace, it violates our sense of justice. For that matter, I believe it's why so many Christians have their own benchmarks for what it takes to become a recipient of grace. Baptism, just a certain way. Communion, just a certain way. Accepting Jesus into your heart, just a certain way. Confession, penance, absolution, in a certain way. We cling so tightly to these definers of the in-group and the out-group of grace. Because then even us fellow Jesus followers can look at each other and say, hey, grace is for me, not you. At least not yet. The book of Jonah is one of those whimsical biblical stories that we like to tell to children. Really, we tend to think any biblical stories with animals in them are appropriate for kids. But seriously, people, a story about God drowning the entire earthly population, save one family and two of every animal, is probably not the best bedtime story for kids. Jonah, however, is a story I think kids need to hear again and again. Grown-ups need to hear it again and again. We need to tell this story to teach grace in the same way we tell the story of the boy who called Wolf to teach honesty. Too often Jonah is mischaracterized as a story about obedience about the consequences of not listening to God. But Jonah is primarily a story about grace, about God's plan of grace for everyone and our deep-seated unwillingness to accept it or participate in it. In the Jewish tradition, this story is often told right around this time in the Jewish calendar, the Jewish High Holy Days the time when people of the Jewish tradition and faith celebrate the new year. They do so with two days of celebration called Rosh Hashanah, and then they enter 10 days of repentance and ultimately culminate in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the story of Jonah is told on Yom Kippur to prepare people for the scandal of grace. As several biblical commentaries note, Nineveh was one of the most prominent foreign cities in the Bible, 120,000 people. And while many prophets were sent to preach justice, the way of justice, to their own people, Jonah is sent to the pagans, people of another faith, another ethnicity, the enemies of his people. The book of Jonah begins, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the greatest city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, we might imagine that Jonah would be ecstatic about this. He gets to go condemn his enemies, people he thinks are despicable, deplorable. 
But far from seeming excited, Jonah refuses to go. He runs away, heading in the opposite direction of the city. He even boards a boat to try to get as far away from the city of Nineveh as he can. And I know what some of you might be thinking. Oh, poor, soft, liberal snowflake. He doesn't want to condemn or preach against anyone, so he's running away. But no, as we find out, that's not why Jonah is on the run. Most of us know the story. God sends a huge storm while Jonah is on that boat. And when the sailors he's with find out that he's running from God and that the storm is probably because he angered God, they throw him overboard. And God has Jonah swallowed up by a big fish. It sounds a little fairy tale esque But there's truth there, right? Sometimes it's only in the chaotic moments when life seems to be swallowing us whole that we acknowledge our own underbelly. And that's just what happens to Jonah. There in the belly of the whale, he prays a deeply moving prayer in which he expresses his trust that even though he refused to do what God asked of him, even though he ran in the opposite direction, God will show him grace, save him, because God loves him. And I suppose you could say he discovers there in that belly that he probably owes it to God to go to Nineveh. So when the whale vomits him out, Jonah finally agrees to go preach against the Ninevites and tell them that God will rain down destruction on their city if they don't repent, if they don't change their ways, if they don't stop oppressing the vulnerable and harming the marginalized. But of course, they do repent. Nineveh actually listens to Jonah. They turn away from injustice and they turn toward what is just. And God decides not to follow through with God's great threat of destruction. Is Jonah relieved? No. Jonah is livid. You see, it turns out that Jonah had initially run away from God's call to preach to the Ninevites, not because he had a problem calling them to justice or holding them accountable to doing justice or even threatening them with destruction. He ran away because he knew God. He knew God was a God of grace and that God would ultimately offer them that grace, that very grace that Jonah himself had needed in the belly of the well, that God would offer it to these foreign people, these enemies of his people, and not make them pay for their crimes. And that infuriated Jonah. So Jonah starts whining to God. This is why I fled, God. I knew you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, he's upset because God is being for others exactly what he needed God to be for him when he was in the belly of that whale. He huffs and he shouts, now Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than live. It sounds pretty immature. I mean, can you say drama queen? Can you say two-year-old temper tantrum? That is until we think about our own enemies. Think about those who have harmed us. If you've ever been bullied or abused, violated or mistreated by someone or someone you love has been, then you know why Jonah is so angry. Patiently, God asks Jonah if it's right for him to be angry. And then we get this beautiful scene where God teaches Jonah a powerful lesson. It's scorching hot and Jonah needs shade. So God makes this big leaved plant bush thing grow up and provide shade and relief for Jonah. Jonah loves the plant. It's cool, feels great. But the next day God sends a worm to eat it. And Jonah is again livid with God. He's miserable in the heat without the shade of that plant. And he tells God again that he just wants to die. He's a dramatic guy. Again, God asks him, is it right for you to be angry? God says, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. Should I not be as concerned 
for the great city of Nineveh with 120,000 people and animals as well. Whoops, <laughs> sorry about that. The story can be hard for us to stomach because it showcases that God is more invested in each and every life than we are. That God is invested even in those lives who commit injustices. That God is not willing to give up on or throw away anyone, even if they really, really deserve it. You see, the story of Jonah teaches that God's justice is different than our justice. Our justice cares about retribution. But God's justice is always about just one thing, moving us toward beloved community, which means stopping injustices in their tracks, stopping people from harming each other, stopping the vulnerable from being exploited, making sure everyone has what they need. But when that is achieved, when the wrongs have been righted so that everyone can live in beloved community, when everyone is fed and cared for, all the rest is grace. And maybe that bothers some of us. We want someone to have to pay. Tomorrow is World Peace Day. Sometimes it's mind-boggling how many wrongs would have to be righted in order for us to achieve peace in our world. How many injustices stopped. And frankly, I know some of us might be feeling downright hopeless about it today. I'm sure the mountain of justice looked massive to Justice Ginsburg at the beginning of her career too. But slowly she took step after step after step up that steep incline and dragged our country, even many of her enemies, along with her. Because I think she, in her Jewish faith, she knew this story of Jonah. And she knew that justice isn't about going backward and making wrongdoers pay. Instead, it's about going forward and setting the oppressed free. Perhaps the thing about peacemaking that is hardest for us to wrap our heads and our hearts and our minds around is that in God's kingdom, no one has to pay the price for peace. Peace needs justice, God's justice, but it doesn't need our justice. It doesn't need retribution or punishment. It doesn't need violence. The entire Judeo-Christian tradition, the entire arc of the Bible, it points to a counterintuitive way of peace, a way that involves grace and forgiving our enemies. The truth is we don't need those on the other side of the aisle or those on the other side of the world to pay for their crimes. We just need the harm and the violence and the injustice to stop to be righted. We need all of us to turn back toward that dream of God's, of beloved community. We need everyone to be cared for. And yes, some restitution might be involved in that, but mostly what we need is the healing and the way forward. So as righteous as some of us may feel, as much as many of us may consider ourselves peacemakers, I wonder if we are truly moving in the direction of peace or if we are running away from it. I wonder if we are embracing and chasing after God's grace for the world or if we are fleeing from it, resisting it. Those belly of the whale moments when we are reminded of our own deep need for grace, our own deep need for salvation and provision, those might be if we let them, opportunities to step back into the way of peace and of grace. If we need grace, then so does everyone else around us, including those who have done great harm. In fact, that may be the only way to move into peace together. 
One of our favorite songs to sing as a congregation is a newer hymn called For Everyone Born, A Place at the Table. But I always find myself cringing a little when we get to that verse, for just and unjust, a place at the table, abuser abused with need to forgive, in anger and hurt, a mindset of mercy, for just and unjust, a new way to live. And I always want to rewrite that part about forgiveness. I always want to change it to abuser abused with need to repent. And perhaps that needs to be there too. But even then, the grace, the mercy, it's a hard pill to swallow. And that's what's so scandalous about this Jesus way that we follow. That at the mercy table of God's kingdom, there is a place set for everyone born for all of God's beloved. Many of us are happy to speak against the injustices of the world. We're happy to be that voice crying out in the wilderness for justice. But when justice comes, will we be ready to accept the grace God will offer? Not just for us, but for everyone? Will we be ready to sit down at the table across from our enemies and watch them too receive God's meal of love. As the famous Psalm 23 reads, O God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We will always throw roadblocks in the way of peace until we, be, until we fully welcome that radical truth of God's grace, not just for us, but for everyone born. May we learn to do that. Amen. Let's celebrate together uh, great Gregory's music ministry among us the last many years here, more than my time. This is Bill Cooley. I, as a choir member, I really appreciate his patience with me, who couldn't even read music, <laughs> and selecting music that the way you, he played, you played, uh, could be incredibly energetic, but also singable for someone like me. And it was just, I really appreciated your energy and your presence and your incredible musical talents. Thank you. His theological and spiritual concern for the music that he played and how it adapted to each worship service. Thank you, Jay. Well, I really appreciated his, his love of food and cooking, and I think we all benefited from that uh, all the times. He said, oh, no problem. I'll cook dinner for 70 people, um, so, and, and it was always delicious, so that was another one of his gifts. Thank you. I always enjoyed at the beginning of the service how he put, uh, pr prior to the service, that he would put his own spin on old hymns and play some of the hymns that I remember from my childhood. I, I got a big kick out of that. Thank you, Bev. <laughs> I was thinking along those same lines. I, I loved coming early and just listening to all those old hymns and singing along. Uh, oh, so much, so much that I'll miss about Gregory. Oh my gosh, through the years, he was just marvelous. Miss you, Gregory. Yeah, I, I will definitely uh, miss his smile. He was always very positive, always a positive soul and very, um, just never, you know, just no matter what's going on, he's always super friendly and uh, genuine. And of course, he enjoyed his awesome music, so. I always felt that the music meant so much more after he would uh, teach it to us. Uh, we would sing it in a new way. Uh, and he was just um, so marvelous in, in, in that he could uh, um, look beyond just his need, but to the needs of the world. It was a wonderful way he would lead us as we led the church in worship. Thank you, Roy. As a choir member, I always appreciated how 
so many of the songs were things that he actually wrote. The words, the lyrics, the uh, tunes. And I think for such a small choir, he was able to pull our strengths together so that it would sound good. It was always amazing to me how four, five, six of us could actually make a make a sound that sounded as good as it did. And um, I was amazed by that. But because he adapted things so that it would meet our needs and, and, and develop our strengths. And I appreciated that. And um, I, I'll miss him now and for a long time because I had a share. We often shared conversation as well. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, I think many of us don't or didn't know that he especially arranged most pieces for our choir. Um, he would think about the voices in our choir and arrange it just so, so that it would sound phenomenal. And I think the thing that I remember the most is um, just how um, awe-filled and pregnant the air would feel when he when the he and the choir hit that last note of a big song, and um, it was like the whole room had been lifted up with them. He, I don't know how many people know, he really wrote the theme song for the first Pride uh, worship service that happened in Pinellas mm -hmm. County that I know has continued through the years. And we sang it every year on Pride Sunday. Um, and I found that music inspiring. Um, and thank you, Gregory, for all that you did for um, the Pride service and for us as a community that celebrated that part of our world and life and community. Mm -hmm. I'm Jim Moore here. I have one comment. I'd like to, a couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, I was on the personnel committee when we hired him and uh, how excited we were when we heard him play. And um, uh, we were behind his back as he was playing at the piano and we were silently applauding and cheering. And I thought, oh, we found this choir guy, the musician. And, uh, and we were all very excited. Robin, you were there. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I also appreciated uh, uh, the programs, the presentations, the entertainment side, uh, those, those uh, great moments, I think, in, in, the, in the fellowship kind of uh, presentations that he had in the evening sometimes, and several over the course of a year, and uh, over several years. And uh, most entertaining, uh, some a little bawdy, um, but always uh, great music that was a great spirit, and uh, I'll miss that. Yes, all those fundraisers and concerts that were beautiful moments for us as a community. Are there any others want to sell a, or share a celebration? Yes, uh, I, this is Noel. I have a, I, as one who studied piano for a long time, and can barely play a hymn now. Um, it sounded like there were at least four hands and 20 fingers on that piano when he played. It was the ease with which music just rippled through those keys was just wonderful and amazing. The second thing was his, his love, his graciousness, I love to go over and give him a hug and um, just, you know, share affection after the service. The third thing, I will never forget those seven or nine cakes, unbelievable <laughs> cakes that he brought for that fundraiser. Um, I never heard of such things or tasted such things before. And the fourth, is that he was so gracious and open to my friend Janet Holden, uh, my former choir director in Conne uh, Connecticut and soloist, when uh, we discovered that they had a um, weekend house in Lutz and would come down and allowed her to sing. Um, 
and he was open and bringing so many other musician friends of his own to enhance our services on special days. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, yeah Gregory see, but, certainly went above and beyond. It was never just a paycheck to him. He really loved our congregation, and I'm so grateful for that. Jean Hi, this is Martha. Um, I've heard all of you speaking of our love for him, and I have to agree with that, but also his love for us. He just poured out his love each and every one of us in the choir supported us, uh, engaged us in such a way that we could be a benefit to the church. But uh, it wasn't just the choir members, as you, all of you have said, it was everyone. And we will miss his love for us as much as we, he might miss our love for him. Definitely. Thank you, Martha. I just wanted to say that, um, Greg, I thank you for feeding my soul as well as my body. Mm. Thank you, Jean. I'd like to say that um, in so many conversations with Gregory, um, I felt like I felt that love from him. And I know that it was very important for him to to be to make a difference in the lives of other people and i just want you to know gregory that you have definitely done that for so many of us uh you've touched our hearts and uh, calmed us with your music and inspired us with your music and um, you've been there for us in so many ways and and we truly love you and respect you Thank you for being there. Our creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, each week I invite you to continue giving to the congregation. Um, your giving, your investing out of what God has given to you, it allows us to keep pursuing our mission of building beloved community in Pinellas Park and beyond. This week I had the privilege of being able to be at the, the food pantry uh, and I watched these amazing volunteers serve 40 people from our community. Um, I shot some footage that hopefully will be in a video you can see soon so that you get to see the, the, just the amazing work that they do. Um, but it's incredible and they are hopping, um, just running around that pantry building trying to meet the needs of our community. Um, so I pray that you would continue to give generously that we might continue that ministry uh, and and all the very various ministries uh, we have in our congregation right now that are keeping us connected um, the community fed if you'd like to give you can go to www.discovergoodsam.org give or you can mail in a check or you can bring a check or money by uh, the food pantry and they will accept it there and now i'd like to ask uh, robin to lead us in the doxology Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Christ all creatures here below. Praise Holy Spirit evermore. Praise Triune God who we adore. Amen. Let us pray and bless these gifts that will come in this week. God, we pray that what is shared with us out of what you have, have shared with each of us, that it would be used to build beloved community, that it would be used to make peace in our world. Not just keep the peace, but make peace. 
a peace founded on justice, on injustices righted, on love, on grace. Amen. We have a few announcements this week. First is that our food pantry is in need of soups, vegetables, and mac and cheese. Friends, when I was there on Thursday, I saw that most of the shelves are bare, despite the fact that we keep bringing in carload after carload of food. Um, so as much as you can help us keep that pantry stocked, um, we would really appreciate it. We have uh, our How to Be an Anti-Racist discussion beginning after church today at one o'clock. There'll be a brief break so you can go grab something to eat and then we will be back on same Zoom ID at one o'clock. Um, please join us for this time. Even if you haven't read, um, you will be able to engage in the discussion and we hope you will come. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, we have a, an event, Bible Trivia Night, with uh, Martha Taylor and Pastor Jen, myself. <laughs> and uh, Martha has written all these wonderful uh, Bible trivia questions for us, and so I'm excited uh, to be on and have um, some fun and some laughs and figure out how much we know or don't know <laughs> about the Bible. And now, friends, go out into the world. Follow our God of grace even when God leaves you to places that are uncomfortable, that you may not want to go, go and be peacemakers in our world. Friends, thank you for being on with us. Uh, I will stick around for a few minutes after worship if you would like to uh, share any more joys or concerns. And then, like I said, we will be on at one o'clock for our discussion. And now will you shout out with me? You'll have to unmute your mic. We're going to shout out Shalom, Salam, Peace. Are you ready? Shalom. 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 Peace, my peace. friends. Peace.